started with our next session. We're very short on time, so I'm just going to very briefly introduce uh, our next uh, lecturers. Uh, first, we have Adam Weiss, Legal Director at the European Roma Rights Center. Tomas Madani, Program Director at the Unre Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization. Janos Fiala Butorov from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And Neil Clark, who is the head of Europe and Central Asia Program at MRG Europe. And Evelyn Barhash from TLI will be moderating the session. So today has been the day dedicated to the assessment of the European regime of minority protection. So in the morning we had an overview of its history, norms, institutions and mechanisms, and then we just finished with a panel that focused on the effectiveness of particle institutions. And now we are having a panel which will focus on how civil society actors are using the current framework. But before we are moving to the panelists to give their presentations, I just want you to put out some questions that I think you should start thinking about when you are listening to the presentations, when you are reflecting on these presentations and uh, preparing for your questions. So the first question is that I would like you to consider. How do you see the limitations of the particle mechanisms or institutions civil society actors use during this presentation? Or they talk about in their presentations. Do you think civil society actors use the current framework in the most effective way? How the current system you think could be improved? Is it about, and I'm referring back to what Gaetano said yesterday, is it about enhancing anti-discrimination strategies? Or is it about strategic litigation? Or is it about more uh, case-specific lobbying? Or it should be all of the above, having a comprehensive advocacy strategy, which also links global, regional, state level, and local grassroots advocacy, or something else. Maybe we need a movement. So these are the questions that I want you to start considering when you're listening to these presentations. Also, think about how the effectiveness is assessed. What is needed to ensure that minorities' existence and identity are protected? They are not targets of discrimination and they can participate in social, economic, cultural life, I mean, uh, <clears throat> in cultural life and in public affairs equally. Is it only about norms and standards? Or is it also about implementation? And more and more questions that I want to start thinking, although you won't be able to respond to this now, because we haven't gone over all of the uh, other regional systems. But the European system has been always considered as the most developed one. Is the most developed one, it's actually the most effective one. And we're gonna come back to this question on Thursday um, when we finish the discussion on the African uh, system. So I would like to ask Adam to start with his presentation. Thank you so much. I, um... oh great. Uh, I, said, I was so diligent in sending in my presentation a few weeks ago that I've slightly forgotten what's in it. So if I seem like I'm discovering it with you, that's the only reason why. Uh, but thank you so much to the organizers for giving me a chance to come and speak with you today and share with you a bit about the experience of um, the European Roma Rights Center and uh, our work in supporting Romani people to take cases to the European Court of Human Rights. It's very exciting work. It also has a lot of frustrations. Um, and I think that it gets to a lot of the questions that we were just uh, hearing about. Um, so what I want to do is introduce you to the ways that the European Court of Human Rights has and has not worked to advance the rights of Romani people in Europe um, and discuss what the ERRC is doing. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights is without a doubt the most significant institution that our NGO is engaging with in order to overcome anti-gypsyism and empower Romani people. Uh, a little bit about the organization. Uh, we were founded 21 years ago here in Budapest, working all across Europe. On the left side, you can see our current kind of, uh, what it says on the tin, basically, what we are, that we're a Roma-led international public interest law organization. We were not always a Roma-led organization, and I think this is quite interesting uh, from thinking about how uh, uh, minority rights movements work, and particularly the Roma rights movement has worked. The, the ERRC was founded a bit to be like some of the organizations in the United States that have worked to empower ethnic minorities. Um, but unlike those organizations, such as the, the NAACP uh, in the US, the ERRC was not founded by members of the minority group. It was founded by, essentially, by white people who wanted to see 
a, uh, uh, a movement take, uh, take up in Europe. And it was only two and a half years ago that the ERRC became Roma-led for the first time. I'm not a Romani person myself, but our president, Georgia Jovanovic, is a Romani man from Serbia. And our board chair, Ethel Brooks, is a Romani woman from the United States. Um, and it was only about a year ago that we became a Roma majority staff for the first time. Um, so these were important milestones for us. In terms of the issues that we work on, you see up there school segregation, housing segregation, forced evictions, segregated maternity wards, um, and there's even dot, dot, dot at the end. There are a lot of issues. Basically, uh, a wide range of public law issues affecting Romani people in Europe. Uh, when I say public law, what I essentially mean is that we challenge public authorities who discriminate against Romani people. So we don't, you won't find employment up there, for example, uh, although the public, public institutions do discriminate against Roma in employment as well, but we mainly focus on uh, public law matters such as education. Um, and we are mainly litigating. Uh, we're an organization dedicated to using rights in order to empower Romani people to overcome anti-Gypsyism. And while that doesn't only mean litigation, because we also engage in advocacy and other forms of activity, uh, litigation is the most visible tool that we use to empower Romani people to assert their rights. Uh, you've got a map of Europe there on the left. Uh, I don't know if the shading comes across very clear, but you've got different shades of red, basically, based on where we're litigating. The darker the shade, it means the more cases that we have. Um, and you might see, or maybe you won't see very clearly, but basically we have a kind of concentration of dark red in this area of Europe. Uh, our, for funding reasons in particular, about 70% of our work right now is focused outside the European Union, mainly in the Western Balkans, but also in Ukraine, Moldova, and Turkey. But we do have cases elsewhere uh, as well. Um, uh, in case you don't know uh, too much about Roma already, you uh, may have seen this figure. There are 10 to 12 million Romani people living in Europe, and Roma are Europe's largest ethnic minority. I've used the term anti-Gypsyism a couple of times already. This wasn't a term that was being used very widely a couple of years ago but it's a term that's designed to encapsulate the specific forms of racism and discrimination that Roma and certain other stigmatized groups face. I won't read the definition to you. There are a couple of definitions floating around out there, but this is the definition that was uh, endorsed by a group of NGOs, including the ERRC. Um, we have currently 49 active cases that we're involved in pending before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, in the majority of those cases, the ERRC is representing the applicants. So that is that our NGO is doing a legal function, essentially, legal representation before the European Court of Human Rights. You might think that that involves someone standing up in a gown and a wig in a court. It doesn't. The vast majority of litigation in the European Court of Human Rights is done just on the papers. So it's through the fax machine and the post office. Um, in most of the other cases, the ERRC intervenes as a third party. So that means that someone else has taken the case to the European Court, and we see an opportunity to add something to the case through written submissions. And in a small number of cases, we're providing other support. So there may be a lawyer who's already taken the case, and we're just consulting with them behind the scenes. We're helping them draft submissions. Uh, and there are 16 countries involved, and these are right across Europe. But, uh, but as I mentioned, there is that concentration on Southeast Europe. Um, a few key notions from the European Court of Human Rights. I don't know too much about uh, what you've learned about the European Court, but you may know already that before you go to the European Court of Human Rights, you are supposed to have exhausted domestic remedies. So usually you wouldn't go straight to the European Court. You would go through the national legal system. So that means that uh, for the other cases that we're currently involved in, most of those are before the national courts. And they're often being set up in a way that are designed to make sure, that's designed to make sure that the case can eventually get to the European Court of Human Rights. But this is um, uh, a malleable notion. I think the European Court itself in one of its guides says that this is uh, a rule that is golden and not cast in stone, which is very poetic. But basically what they mean is that there's, there's, you don't necessarily have to have gone through the national legal system if you can show that the remedies available in that legal system are not particularly effective. And so we've taken some cases directly to the European Court of Human Rights or in circumstances where uh, you might think that we hadn't done enough. Subsidiarity is a pretty key notion, um, which we could probably spend days and days talking about, but essentially the notion that it's to the national level authorities and courts to resolve matters uh, before those matters rise up to European level. So the European Court shouldn't get involved if it doesn't have to. And in terms of discrimination, the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 14 prohibits discrimination in the protection of other rights. So we're mainly concerned about race discrimination 
But the way the European Convention is structured, it's not just that any form of discrimination is prohibited. It's that discrimination is prohibited in connection with other rights. There is an exception to that for those countries that have ratified Protocol 12 to the Convention, which is only a handful, but it's a fortunate handful for us because it's most of the countries that we're now working in, such as Serbia, Albania, and Macedonia. Um, so I thought I'd ask you a question now, because you're probably already bored of, of hearing me go on. Uh, so the Euro European Court of Human Rights delivers just under 1,000 judgments every year around Europe. What percentage of those judgments do you would think involve cases brought by Romani litigants? You can do some quick math in your head if you'd like. There are 800 million people in the Council of Europe space. I told you around 10 to 12 million of those are Roma. 15%. 15%. Twenty percent. One percent. Anyone else? Seven percent. Five percent. Zero percent. I feel like I grew up in the U.S. There was a great game show called The Price Is Right, where everyone has to get uh, less than one percent. So I think whoever guessed zero would be the winner if this if this were the game show. Um, and I I hope that that is shocking. I mean I find it shocking. Um, because it, it underrepresents uh, the population of Romani people in Europe, um, but also if you were to go online right now and, write, and, and, and Google human rights violations Roma, you would see a lot about human rights violations that Roma are suffering, and you would probably hear a lot about how the national systems aren't working to resolve them, so you'd think the European Court of Human Rights would be busy, and it's not as busy. Um, and just one other question for you. In 2000, the year 2000, the European Union introduced legislation banning racial discrimination in a wide range of areas. This is just the EU now, so 27, or 28 member states, seem to be 27. Uh, how many Roma-related cases have made their way to the Court of Justice of the European Union? Which is the highest court in the EU. Zero. I think I put you off now. There has been one. <laughs> one case. Interestingly, brought by a non-Roma person living in a Romani neighborhood in Bulgaria where the electric company was putting all the meters on seven, the electricity meters, the counters were put on these high posts, seven meters high, so that people couldn't reach them. Whereas normally an electricity meter is in your closet, I know mine is in my closet in my flat in Budapest, but they didn't want people in the Roma neighborhood to be able to touch their meters for discriminatory reasons. Um, so I think that there's really an access to justice problem, right? There's a huge gap between what we know is the human rights situation that Roma are facing in Europe, and the level of justice, right? And it's not just about numbers, of course, um, but we're not seeing a lot of case law coming out of the European Court of Human Rights or even from the Court of Justice of the EU about Romani people. Um, but, but Roma have managed to accomplish quite a bit in Strasbourg so far, particularly in relation to school segregation, police brutality and murder, and forced sterilization. Um, on school segregation, there have been cases that Romani people have brought, um, some with our support, uh, particularly DH and others versus the Czech Republic. This was a case that focused on the widespread diagnosis of Romani children as having learning disabilities in the Czech Republic and their placement in special schools. Um, Orsic and others versus Croatia was a case about uh, Romani children in Croatia who did not speak Croatian as their first language when they were small children. There are many Roma who speak Romanes or other Roma-specific languages. And so they arrive at kindergarten and the teachers say, oh, we're going to put you all in a separate classroom to learn Croatian. And then the children stay in that separate class for 12 years. Uh, that was also condemned as a form of segregation. What I think is interesting about these cases is that if you look at the DH case, the case first went to a chamber of seven judges. And that chamber of seven judges voted that there was no violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. They, it makes a very interesting reading, but they essentially bought the Czech government's argument, which was to say, well, this is the way that we found to bring Romani children into the school system. So if it weren't for this, we would have nothing for this group of children, and six of the seven judges bought that, and it was reversed in the Grand Chamber. And you don't automatically get to go to the Grand Chamber if you've lost in the Chamber, in the European Court of Human Rights. Very few cases make it to the Grand Chamber. And Orsic, I think, is even more interesting on the numbers, because in the Chamber, seven judges voted no violation. Right? They said, well, it's perfectly justified. These children don't speak Croatian. And some Romani children who did speak Croatian were in the ordinary class. And that was overturned by a Grand Chamber, nine votes to eight. So again, if you're mathematically inclined and you do the math, more judges voted against a violation than for a violation, but the right to nine judges lined up. There's only one judge in common between the two formations. There have been some other cases about school segregation as well, 
uh, when, and particularly in Greece, where Roman people have been able to establish that there's a problem. But these cases have been extremely difficult to decide, I think it's fair to say, and even more difficult to implement. If you were to take the drive now a couple of hours from here to Ostrava in the Czech Republic, I think you'd see a situation that isn't so very different from what it was when these cases were originally brought. Things are better in some respects, but not completely better. Uh, police brutality and murder, Articles 2 and 3 taken with Article 14. Uh, and this is getting technical into the legalities of things, but um, there have been a lot of cases, I think this makes up the majority of cases brought by Romani litigants to the European court, have been about hate crimes, so uh, physical abuse of Romani people and the failure to investigate it, and also police brutality cases. And when it comes to these police brutality cases, we see this very commonly across Europe, where police physically abuse Romani people and also usually accompanied by racial slurs. And then Romani people make a complaint, usually to the prosecutor, about this. And then there's no investigation that goes anywhere. And then the European Court of Human Rights will say, ah, there was a failure of the authorities to investigate this act of police brutality. Violation of Article 14 taken with the procedural limb of Article 2 or 3. If the people were killed, Article 2. If the people were uh, uh, ill-treated, Article 3. So there's been a procedural violation, but the court is very reluctant to find a substantive violation that the police actually brutalized the victims on the basis of their ethnicity. And often the court will say, well, we just don't know. The evidence just wasn't there because of the lack of the investigation, which is very frustrating. Um, there are a handful of cases where they find both violations, but it's become very, very tough, and we feel we've gotten a bit stuck with the European Court of Human Rights on this issue. And what we've tried to do now is bring a separate kind of case in the domestic courts, a civil discrimination case, suing the police and saying, you are institutionally racist. We're seeing where we get with that. And with forced sterilization, there have been some very interesting cases brought to the European Court of Human Rights by women, particularly in this part of Europe, in the Czech Republic, in Slovakia, and in Hungary, who were forcibly sterilized in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and in one case, in 2008. Um, you'll find cases where there is a, a, a finding of a violation, but this case, VC versus Slovakia, makes very interesting reading. They found a violation of this woman's right to respect for private life, but they weren't willing to find discrimination. They were taking the isolated case of one Romani woman who was sterilized against her will. Um, and they were saying, yes, there was a violation here. But the court wasn't willing to tap into the larger pattern of forced sterilizations of Romani women and saying this was discriminatory. And this is part of the problem with using the European Court of Human Rights to get justice for an ethnic minority group whose rights are being systematically violated because the court wants to zero in on that individual case. And then in terms of the next frontier, and I'm probably uh, almost up on time, uh, uh, forced evictions and trying to use the court's interim measures mechanism to stop them, challenging the criminalization of begging. Uh, which is becoming more and more common in Europe. Um, so these are some of the things that I'd be happy to talk with you about maybe during the question and answer session, and I will, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for this excellent presentation on how a particular European mechanism could be used um, to protect um, the rights of one particular minority group. So now I can ask the master to talk about how a major European institution like the EU can be used by civil society organizations. Uh, thank you, Evelyn. Is the presentation on? Yeah. Uh, so I already introduced my organization, UNPO, uh, quite enough yesterday. Uh, so just for those of you who are not here, we, we are a membership organization that advocates for minority and indigenous rights and for in many cases around the world that you can see on the map. Uh, as someone asked me today, uh, why are you based in Brussels? I, I told them that I would explain it in the afternoon. So our main office is in Brussels. And, yeah. and, and this is, uh, well, it's not a decision that we took in the beginning. We started moving there 10 years ago because we thought there would be space there to, to work and to advocate for the rights the rights of the communities that we represent. Uh, just as a reminder, even though you saw it on the map, most of the communities that we work with are not based in the EU. So you will wonder why are you there and what exactly can you expect to obtain. So of course for those few cases uh, that are within the EU, the explanation is obvious. It's a way to put pressure on, on the governments through an institution that they are a part of, a, a supranational organization. 
Uh, and there, I mean, all these uh, countries are bound by a number of treaties that are within the framework of the EU. But when it is not about EU member states, then what is the reason? I mentioned it vaguely yesterday. Uh, the EU is an important trade partner for many countries, for obvious reason. It's a, it's a huge block of uh, several hundred million inhabitants that are all relatively, uh, like, I mean, wealthy countries. It's an important aid donor for many third countries around the world. So two departments of the Commission uh, take care of development aid and humanitarian aid. Uh, and in all these... Uh, transfers of money, the EU is at least supposed to, in theory, pose as a condition that human rights standards are respected. So when the EU meets with a third country and they make a trade agreement, they, the third country has to promise that they will respect human rights. And the same happens when they receive aid. Uh, the problem is that then the EU is not always very strong in underlining the importance of these conditions, or rather it is very careful in withdrawing these um, these uh, this aids or in um, stopping trades because of human rights and that's why there are many NGOs in Brussels who put pressure on the EU uh, to change this. So the the EU, as you as many of you might know, but some of you might not know, has several institutions which we uh, approach for different reasons. Uh, there's the European Parliament, the European Commission, the European External Action Service, and then there's the Council of the EU, and there are many perm reps, which is. Uh, Brussels jargon for permanent representation, so it's the missions that EU member states have in Brussels that represent their interests uh, with the institutions. So when it comes to the European Parliament, uh, as many of you might know, it is not like a national parliament, so it doesn't have as much power, it doesn't adopt laws, it contributes to the process that leads to regulations and so on, but let's say its power is not uh, as evident uh, but nonetheless, they have a very important role uh, in representing the EU and members of the European Parliament are involved in, inter in the international relations of the EU in many forms. There's, a, like in many parliaments, a committee that is in charge of, uh, of human rights, which is always good to lobby, uh, to, to let's, say, let's say to raise awareness of the cases that we work on and to show the perspective of our members. Uh, same for the Foreign Affairs Committee for obvious reasons, even though there are other interests than human rights overlap. And then there are uh, delegations that are groups that work on specific countries uh, or regions of the world. Uh, the problem is that there as well, many people, many members of the European Parliament who are active there are actually more interested in the, in the trade aspect of the relations with those countries rather than in the human rights aspects. Uh, there are then friendship groups, which are an interesting... Uh, concept. There are groups of MEPs who come together to work on a specific topic or in some cases even on a specific community. There's a friendship group for Tibet and there's a friendship group also for the Uyghur community in China that uh, UNPO helped establish. Uh, the power of it is not huge but it's a way to raise awareness more regularly and to keep the whole parliament informed about how things work. Wait, I'll just go back. On the right hand side I put the different political groups uh, because that's an important part of our work. We try to work with as many groups as possible. Some are uh, friendlier to the issues that we work on, like the European Free Alliance, where most of the parties that fight for self-determination in Europe are. They are generally very interested in our cases, even though they're not in Europe, because they feel sympathy for these communities that face similar situations and often uh, are in a much worse condition. But unfortunately, you have to work with the big groups, especially the EPP and the Socialists and Democrats, because they are the ones who, who have the power. Um, so what do we do in the European Parliament? We, we raise awareness of the cases, we just go and tell what it is about, going, as I mentioned yesterday, with our members, because we want them to be the ones who, who explain what it is about, and uh, because they're more credible and because they can tell personal stories and add personal elements. You will meet one of them on, on Thursday or Friday, Dolkun Isa from the Uyghur community. Then in uh, certain cases we can lead to the adoption of resolutions. Again, they don't have really have a direct power, but they annoy countries where, where these communities live in and they force them to explain themselves and justify themselves. Uh, we can get them to ask parliamentary questions to, uh, to, the, to the European Commission or to the European External Action Service, which forces uh, the, foreign, the foreign affairs people of the EU to look into the issue at least and to show that they are engaged in some form. Uh, and then there are a number of other instruments to, to raise awareness and put pressure on other institutions.
The European External Action Service, as I said, is more or less the foreign ministry of the EU. It's not called foreign ministry because EU member states haven't given up that part of, uh, of their sovereignty, uh, let's say, but they do have a role in international diplomacy. And as you probably know from the media, they had, for example, a big role when it came to the Iran deal, uh, as well as in many other issues. Uh, and so it's very good to keep them informed, to bring the cases of some of our members and, and throughout the years, we have developed a strong relationship with some of the departments because they, they have realized that what we bring is usually not fake news, as someone would say. Uh, on other countries, they don't trust us as much. And this is because the narrative of the state is so strong that our members are labeled as terrorists or violent. And, and so it takes time. But still, generally, they, they accept to meet and they are interested in hearing different opinions. So it's very important to meet with them if you want to bring a point of view, especially in the run-up to uh, meetings between the EAS and the third country, in which they might discuss even directly uh, human rights. Two weeks ago, I was in a, in a meeting about um, uh, human rights in China. Uh, together with uh, other NGOs, we were preparing the External Action Service for their negotiations with China, telling them what the priorities were in our point of view. So uh, it is definitely important to be at the table to make sure that the issues that concern minority communities are addressed. I still have a couple of minutes, right? Okay, good. <laughs> Today I'm more efficient then. Uh, then there is the European Commission, which can be seen as the government, let's say, of the EU with several departments. As I mentioned before, there are two departments that are specifically in, uh, in charge of development aid and of humanitarian aid. Uh, the difference is that humanitarian aid is usually um, given when there are emergency, emergencies, being either wars, conflicts, or natural, natural disasters. And they are supposed to be more uh, short-term or medium-term to solve a specific problem, while, the, while development uh, aid could be given potentially forever because it's just to help uh, let's say improve the situation of uh, in, in a country, for example, of the education sector or other issues. It is important to lobby these institutions to make sure that funds actually reach all the population, that they reach minority areas, that they reach minority communities, and that not all the money goes through the government who then can just feed the part of the country that it prefers. Occasionally, there are other departments that can be interesting uh, that work on environment, on climate, uh, or on trade, because it is important, once again, to put the human rights issue also when there are trade negotiations. Uh, I put there just as a comment that there, were, there was for um, a certain number of years, uh, around 10 years ago, a commissioner that was working on multilingualism, which was obviously very interesting for, for many of our members, even though his uh, remit was mostly EU-focused. Uh, but unfortunately, this department was uh, was dismantled and merged with other um, with other departments. So there is not any more an institution that is so focused on uh, on multilingualisms and on language. So they asked me also to uh, mention the minority safe pack. Uh, but I think then one of you will speak about it this afternoon as well. So I'll just. Uh, give a very brief introduction to what it is. So it's, um, it's an initiative that came from civil society. So several organizations um, made a proposal, basically, well, a list of proposals, but all in a safe pack, uh, that were uh, aimed at protecting minority rights in a more effective way. This was mainly uh, within the EU, but as usual, there's then an influence and a moral power of the EU on the rest of the world. So uh, we thought it was a very important work and we helped advertise it. Some of the interesting points that were included in the pack were, um, well, as I was mentioning before, that funding in general should be targeted to minority individuals or areas that shouldn't be left out and that often are not among the richest parts of the country. Um, a language diversity center was, is to be created, and then that the anti-discrimination framework uh, is to be improved. Of course, these are very, very general definitions, but I'm sure in the Q&A session and in the presentation this afternoon, you will learn more about it. Uh, the important thing was that they didn't want to have a declaration that just... Uh, encourage countries to implement these things, but rather legally binding norms. And even that these norms, the respect for these norms, uh, is put as a criterion for EU membership, which is important now that there are many countries, especially in the Western Balkans uh, and Turkey, that have minorities and that are not always the, the best at respecting their rights. Uh, well, the process, just very quickly, uh, came through signatures. So overall, they collected 1.3 million signatures.
Uh, interestingly, most of them came from uh, Central and Eastern Europe, and in particular Romania, uh, because the Hungarian minority in Romania was particularly engaged in promoting this. Uh, and there was an endorsement by uh, the Hungarian Prime Minister, which is another uh, interesting element. Now the European Commission will have to hold a hearing on the topic, and hopefully some of these proposals will then make it into law, but we will see. I cannot um, offer guarantees at this point. My very, very last point, uh, as I mentioned before, among the proposals that came with this minority safe pack uh, is uh, the creation of a European Union multilingualism agency. Uh, UNPO was among the signatories of a more detailed proposal that was issued, and I brought a few copies if anyone is interested. Um, so basically it would be an agency that is uh, connected and dependent on the European Commission that would be uh, in charge of monitoring the application of principles of the EU that member states are in theory uh, obliged to follow concerning linguistic policy and uh, multilingualism and with a, a real monitoring um, process that could maybe recall the processes that the UN has to monitor human rights um, performance of countries. Uh, so, as I said, I brought a few copies, so don't hesitate to come and have a look if you're interested. And that's it. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much for this really focused, um, excellent presentation on how lobbying of EU institutions, as well as different civil society initiatives, such as the Minority Safe Bank, could be used to promote and protect the rights of minorities in Europe and beyond Europe. Uh, and now I want to ask you uh, to talk about um, uh, the minority specific Council of Europe mechanisms and how they could be used and how they could be integrated as part of a bigger advocacy strategy. Okay, okay so firstly I'll just introduce our organization, the Minority Rights Group. We are an international human rights NGO. We were founded in the late 1960s as a research group initially studying the link between ethnicity, identity and conflict. But over the years we've evolved into kind of an international human rights advocacy organisation working across the world on human rights issues affecting ethnic, linguistic, religious minorities and indigenous peoples. Uh, I think, I mean, there's a bit of a family affair here today. A number of former colleagues, Anna Maria, who was the founder of actually our office in Budapest uh, some years ago, a big influence on our work, Evelyn, former colleague, Chris, Karine, ah, Yosra, I've never met before, nice to meet you. <laughs> and uh, Andre from our Europe office, uh, Jan, my, my predecessor in fact, I haven't seen him for years, and I think you had Alan Phillips this morning. So yeah. our partners, Ali, so we're everywhere, okay? Yeah. If you haven't heard of us, you will by the end of today, so. Anyway, that's us. And we work on a whole range of human rights issues as they affect minorities. So we have projects on conflict resolution, uh, we have programs on education, we have cultural programs, we have a big emphasis on development and economic rights in our work. We operate global strategic litigation programs, we operate global media programs, and we also have regional and specific projects. So we consist of three organisations, we have Minority Rights Group International, which is based in London, and will be there for the foreseeable future Brexit permitting. Uh, we have Minority Rights Group Europe, but we actually are based on the street, just two minutes from here. We've been here since the 1990s, again, founded by Anna Maria. And we have Minority Rights Group Africa based in Uganda, in Kampala. And we also have a number of colleagues scattered around the world, the Osra, in Egypt, for example. But mainly, uh, part of our approach, and I'll refer to this because it, it frames how we do our advocacy, is that we don't set up an office in country. Uh, we tend to, I mean, our principle is working to empower minority civil society organisations. So in all the projects we do, it is about a partnership between MRG and minority-led civil society organisations. So I'm going to talk about shadow reporting to the FCNM today, but I personally have not submitted a shadow report to the FCNM in 10, 12, 15 years, but we have supported many minority-led organisations uh, to do so. So when I describe what our activities are, obviously one of them is human rights advocacy, but perhaps what is quite distinct about our work is that there's an equally significant focus on civil society capacity building. Uh, when I look at kind of the added value of international advocacy and the Council of Europe, we approach it from both these perspectives, a perspective of advocacy and also a capacity building process for civil society. So it's in the moment. 
Okay, so international advocacy and alternative reporting. Did they cover this in the UN session a little bit? Alternative reports, or is this the first presentation? Not really. Okay, so the purpose of alternative reports. So basically, an alternative report is information prepared usually by civil society organizations and submitted to international human rights monitoring bodies. So in this case, I'm talking about the Framework Convention on National Minorities, but of course, this could also be UN treaty bodies. And this is a chance for civil society to provide their perspective on implementation and fulfillment of the rights enshrined in the relevant standards. Now, of course, this is a really important process for all aspects of civil society, but particularly so in minority rights. Because as we know, in many cases, minorities are excluded and are not part of the government processes. So they're not reflected in government reporting. Uh, you might hear different terms used, alternative reports and shadow reports. To be honest, they're completely transferable. You can use both terms, but technically there is a difference. An alternative report refers to any alternative form of information submitted to a human rights monitoring body. So this could be within the cycle of the monitoring of a particular set of standards and norms, or it could be ad hoc information provided to monitoring bodies. Uh, a shadow report work refers specifically to a civil society report which shadows the government's own report. So for most human rights treaties and conventions, the government is required to provide a report, and in response to that, an NGO will provide a shadow report. Uh, for example, in the case of the Framework Convention, usually the government report follows the actual articles of the convention itself. It follows how the, the convention is structured, and the shadow report of the NGO responds to that. Now, at MRG, we tend to do alternative reports, because one thing it's the government reporting is very unreliable. Governments consistently, with both the Council of Europe and the UN, miss their reporting deadlines. And this can be very difficult for an NGO to organise in response to that. And we feel it's very important to ensure that we main, you maintain the regular cycle of reporting. So we always report on a consistent cycle. So we tend to use the term alternative reports in MRG, but particularly in, in certain, certain standards such as the FCN, you'll hear the term shadow reporting used. So anyway, why is alternative reporting important for international advocacy? So I'll be honest, and I don't actually do advocacy with the Council of Europe. When we submit reports to the Council of Europe, it's not because we're expecting the Council of Europe in and of itself to bring about the cha change. Uh, maybe the European Court is a different aspect of it, but in terms of, say, the Framework Convention or... Sorry? <laughs> Or minority, or minority conventions, uh, it doesn't have a great authority. And so actually, what I mean by that is, because you submit a shadow report, because the recommendations of your shadow report are accepted by the advisory committee of the Council of Europe, does not mean that will necessarily they will be implemented within countries. So what we tend to do is actually, we focus most of our advocacy on the European Union, because as described, the European Union has a lot of political leverage. And what we see is that the Council of Europe has authority in that it has standards, it has norms, it has expertise, and it can provide detailed recommendations. So what we try to do is combine different international mechanisms in an advocacy strategy. So an alternative report. Uh, if your input is, uh, is accepted by, say, the Advisory Committee of the Framework Convention of National Minorities, it gives it greater authority. Uh, it gives it great authority with international actors, it can give you great authority with your donors, and it can open opportunities for dialogue with your government which might not previously exist. Uh, one thing to look at is leverage. As I say, in my opinion, perhaps the Council of Europe is not the strongest instrument in terms of human rights leverage, but you can also combine that with other bodies such as the European Union. Awareness raising, you might decide that your priority right now is actually to raise the awareness of the international community. You need international intervention. And, for example, if I'm looking to find information on a country I've not worked in previously, one of the first resources I will do is to look at the opinions of the Advisory Committee of the SCNM in Europe or UN monitoring bodies. And finally, dialogue. Uh, as I said, again, one of the really important aspects of international advocacy is that it can create platforms for dialogue which might be closed within a national context. So, first of all, uh, it can give you a credibility and authority, which even means the government chooses to see you more as a reliable partner 
or because of the leverage of the institution you're working with, whether it's the UN, the Council of Europe, or the EU, they're kind of forced into dialogue with you. Secondary is that often uh, government will engage with you in dialogue away from the country. So if you attend the forum of the Council of Europe or the OSC and the UN, the government might be willing to engage and speak with you, which might not happen in a national context. So I'm, I'm emphasising this because international advocacy can be quite expensive and resource heavy, so you have to be very careful in making all these considerations before you decide whether it's the most important thing for you. So a little bit more specifically about the Framework Convention. So again, was this gone through in detail today in Alan Phillips? No. No, okay. So the Framework Convention on National Minorities has been ratified by most members of the Council of Europe. Uh, the exceptions are Andorra, France, Monaco and Turkey. And I believe that it's been signed but not ratified by Belgium, Greece, Iceland and Luxembourg. There's no specific definition of a national minority within the Convention. And it has a certain structure. The key part of this in terms of shadow reporting is the second section, Articles 4 to 19 which lists the provisions and rights. So this can be culture, education, identity. And basically when you report, this is largely what you're reporting on. You're reporting on the provisions and the rights. Now much of the content of the convention is actually more operational. It's about how rights should be applied in practice. But it does also include a number of rights, most importantly self-identification. So the FCM reporting process, uh, there's a particular cycle to this. I think one of the mistakes NGOs often make in shadow reporting is they focus entirely on the production of the report and the submission of a report. But actually, in any monitoring process, there's a whole cycle which involves several points for information exchange. And it's really important that you map this out in advance and understand where you need to make your information clear to the people who will make decisions in the process. So I'm going to use the FCN as an example, but this can also be relevant to any international monitoring body. So for example, with the FCNM, the key point is on a cycle of every five years, a state should submit a report on its implementation. In theory, they should consult with NGOs. In practice, many of them don't, or they will only consult with gongos. And this should also be made publicly available once the report is submitted. Again, this often does not happen. In parallel to this, as an NGO, you can provide an alternative or shadow report. Now, it's not exclusive that you do one or the other. You can provide input into a state report and also provide a parallel alternative shadow report. Once this has been submitted, the advisory committee of the Framework Convention, which consists of 18 experts, they will review the reports. They will then possibly undertake country visits where they believe there could be greater need for investigation. And following the country visits, they will adopt an opinion. And the opinion will reflect the effectiveness of the implementation uh, of the SCNM in that country and may make specific recommendations to the state. This should be made public after four months, although, again, politically, this can often be a very delayed process. Uh, once this opinion is adopted, it goes to the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, who will adopt a formal resolution following the state response. So that is usually the, the process, but in many cases there will be a number of ad hoc processes for follow-up dialogue, such as seminars, monitoring visits which take place after the submission of the report. So that's the structure of FCNM reporting. And so how do you get involved in this? How do you, how do you structure your advocacy around this? So the first thing, as I mentioned, is to think about can you have input and dialogue into a state report? Can you produce a shadow report? When the advisory committee visits your country, they usually will seek to have a number of seminars and consultations with civil society organisations. Usually the secretary at the Framework Convention, if they receive information from you, will probably want to include you within this dialogue. Unless, of course, there's security concerns which you can make open to them. Uh, also, even if you've not submitted a shadow report, you can be in touch with the Secretariat itself, find out about any processes and participate in this. And this is particularly important because you might submit your shadow report to the AC, but perhaps something's not clear, perhaps there's contradictory information. And this is a really important opportunity face-to-face -to, -face to clarify and emphasise your priorities which you want to see reflected in their opinion. Uh, some other smaller aspects to it is lobbying for the early publication of the AC. 
This gives you more time for advocacy, it gives you more time to develop an effective response. Governments are supposed to translate this into minority languages, but they often don't. And so that responsibility falls upon minority organisations. Particularly, as I said, you know, you want to have an inclusive, participatory process, and the language of the report can exclude many minorities from this. Uh, Publicise the AC opinion. Very few people even know what the FCNM is, including in government, including key duty bearers, have very little knowledge of the AC opinion of the FCNM. So make efforts to publicise this, because in many cases the government themselves will not do this. Uh, plan follow-up actions. When the resolution is adopted, when the opinion is adopted, what can you do within the country to raise awareness of this and engage support for this? And keep the advisory committee informed throughout the process. So once one report is submitted and the resolution is adopted, there's now another five-year process before the next report. Constantly provide information to the AC, keep them updated, keep the process live in this. And also, you can also make recommendations to improve monitoring the report. What does a report look like? So this is actually a really important part of, of best practice, I think, which is really important to MRG. Now, if you go online now, search for shadow reports to the FCNM, you will find that most reports are between 30 and sometimes over 100 pages of information. Uh, at MRG, we say a shadow report should be seven pages. Because we're always thinking of this in terms of an advocacy document and how you communicate to more than the immediate recipients. So first of all, the primary target when you submit this report is the advisory committee. Now, these are very knowledgeable people in minority rights. They care about minority rights. They're interested in what you're writing, but they receive a lot of reports endlessly, and they have to read them. So the key thing is, is to contextualise and condense your key priorities and objectives from this report and bring that to the top of the report. And think about this. When that report's submitted, who else do you want influence with this? You know? An executive summary can be the basis for a press release. It can be the basis for an advocacy statement. If you want to communicate this to the communities you're working with, to your beneficiaries, is sending a 120-page report the best way to communicate this and effective? So what we tend to do is focus on a very, very simple structure which summarises the key points and priorities uh, of your advocacy mission. And then what we would do is annex any additional information. Usually you have very long reports when people want to go through very detailed articles, legal articles and provisions. I mean, this isn't necessary, you know. In many cases, this is provided for the, for the advisory committee, and if they want to follow up on it, they can find this research. And increasingly, we involve things like video clips. Oh, wow, two minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this will be very quick. So, key things to consider when preparing a report. So, what are your priorities on this? Uh, there can be many objectives with a shadow report of international advocacy, but I would say four things are always there. You're always looking to raise attention with a particular international community, you're always looking to develop collaboration, whether it's with a coalition of NGOs submitting a report. A uh, shadow report is a very, very effective coalition building tool because you all have a common objective and a common advocacy purpose. Uh, creating new forms of dialogue, whether it's with governments, international agencies, international NGOs, and using the experience and knowledge of the advisory committee to draft specific recommendations to help resolve the issues and problems you've identified. Remember, these are experts who can draw on experience working on over 40 countries across Europe for this. Very, very important is stakeholder participation, participation of beneficiaries' communities. Whose issue is this, you know? Do not appropriate the voice and the position of minority communities. Many of the organisations we work with produce very detailed analytical reports and they use this as a justification for not having participatory processes in developing a shadow report. They say it's too complicated, it's too detailed for a minority community to engage with. This is not true. Right now in Ukraine, MRG has projects where we're working in Roma communities where the majority of the community is illiterate. We form community action groups. We help them to engage with local decision makers, to list and prioritise key issues, and to identify what they want included in, in the report. We, we explain this, we present this, we present them stakeholders and we provide this feedback to them afterwards and ensure that any advocacy process engages in them. Really consider the resources of this, you know. Is preparing a shadow report worth the time, money and expertise uh, involved in it? Follow up, so I'll go very quickly through this. 
So, make visible the report. Uh, one of the key principles in minority rights advocacy is that the subsidiarity of implementation. So the decision makers closest to minorities and local authorities should be the most important decision makers in implementation of minority rights standards. We did a survey of six Eastern European countries we were working in. 91% of local authority representatives did not know what the FCNM was or what their obligations are. So this is not happening from governments. You can be the actor which is fulfilling this process, is enabling this process, bringing it closer to decision makers within communities. Uh, one point I wanted to make very quickly, I guess I'm really over the time now, is the complementarity of advocacy. As I said, I don't expect the political leverage of the Council of Europe itself to bring about any particular reform. But what you can do is integrate the strengths of different international adv actors in an international advocacy campaign. So, for example, you have the authority and the normative standards of the United Nations, the Council of Europe. This gives you the authority and the legal right, the legal basis for what you're arguing for. For enforcement, you can use the political leverage, the economic incentives of the European Union. The European Union lacks standards in terms of minority rights. It lacks technical capacity to enable their implementation, but it has a, a very important actor in terms of the political process. The, when you get to the stage of wanting to implement, see the implementation of recommendations adopted by the advisory committee, the EU lacks technical capacity in minority rights. It lacks field capacity. The Council of Europe lacks outreach. It does not have field offices. But the OSCE has very strong and effective field offices in country. You can then engage another actor, the OSCE, in, in, in working with the government on implementation of human rights standards. So when we make an advocacy plan, we're not saying of focusing on the FCNM or the Council of Europe itself necessarily to bring about the change, but it's integrated into a bigger picture which works on the strengths and advantages of different international mechanisms. Very quickly, as I said, we also consider alternative reports as a capacity building tool. Even if it does not bring about the necessary advocacy change, the structure of the FCNM, if you are working holistically with a minority community, provides the basis for an organisational strategy to structure and prioritise your work. It can be used as a basis for data collection, which can be used as a resource in all different forms of activity. It's an excellent networking and coalition building resource, and one of the biggest things that we find of international advocacy, it builds the confidence and the authority and organisational profile of minority organisations. The very, very last point, Evelyn, I can see you're, you're waving away at me, is that as we were talking about the Council of Europe, and maybe I said that it doesn't have the biggest leverage in terms of international mechanisms, and I know you wanted me to be very critical of it, but to be honest, I've not actually done direct advocacy with the Council of Europe for so long. But I was thinking, actually, this lack of outreach to the Council of Europe can provide opportunities for civil society organisations. MRG has been involved in the implementation of three projects in recent years, which build on the follow-up to work done by the Council of Europe. We implemented an FCM pro project in Russia, which is a follow-up to a Council of Europe program about the implementation of the Charter on Regional Minority Languages. Right now we have a project in Ukraine, which follows up the Council of Europe's Roma Mediator project, which is a very effective project which trained Roma mediators within the community. This project ended, it was time-bound, the Council of Europe was a lack of resource. We have picked this up with EU funding, and now maintaining the outputs of this project and developing the capacity of Roma mediators. I will just cut it short there. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this really nice presentation. Mm -hmm. I particularly like all the event over time, but I knew what he was going to say, so uh, I wanted to make sure um, that he made two really, really important points. One was how you can use strategically an instrument as part of your wider advocacy plan. And also one thing uh, that Neil was pointing out is really, really important to note. I mean, we can, and, I, and he said I wanted him to be critical of the, the Council of Europe system. But also we have to, um, especially those who are um, using um, uh, any of uh, the, the regional regimes, you have to keep one thing in mind, that you have to work with them. So it's also a role for you. So it is not enough to get the recommendations that say from the advisory committee or the committee of experts, but then you have to have a lot of work to do uh, with these recommendations because states will be unlikely to recommend um, to implement it automatically. 
So you have to keep the pressure on the states at the local level and at the global level as well, combining your regional, global, uh, and local advocacy. Um, well, that's it. Now um, we are going back to the courts. Uh, Adam started out with um, talking about how the European Court of Human Rights can be used to promote the rights uh, of a particular uh, minority community. And now Janos will talk about um, how the courts uh, in the European system can be used to protect different minorities. Um, and because we started late, so I want to uh, make a logistical comment. Uh, we started 20 minutes late, um, so we're going to finish also 15 minutes late to also after Janusz finished the presentation, give him some time, give everyone time um, to um, ask questions. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. And thank you very much for inviting me. I think I will stand up because I don't see the slides from where I sit. Uh, so I will have a very condensed, very short presentation concerning on just one of the few points. But I think I will nicely follow up on some of the things which have been said before me. Uh, so just a few com comments about me. Uh, as Neil mentioned, I used to work at MR MRG. And uh, now I am here as a researcher, but I'm also an active human rights lawyer. So I, I represent uh, victims before courts, including the European Court of Human Rights. And I used to write shadow reports, and even currently I'm involved in advocacy before the, before the Council of Europe. So I will have a bit of a comparison about uh, advocacy uh, before Council of Europe, but this and the European Court of Human Rights. And I would like to get to the reasons why there are so many cases before the European Court of Human Rights, and why we would need to have more. Uh, so Adam talked uh, about the European Court uh, more in detail, which I'm very happy I don't have to. Uh, and he mentioned that you know less than one percent of the cases of the application of the of the decisions uh, of the European Court uh, of the application sorry uh, come from uh, Roma people. I didn't count, but I think it's even less than that coming from national minorities. So there's a minuscule number uh, coming from national minorities, and the number of decisions if you count it's, it's a handful. It's really a dozen decisions over the last fifty years. Which, which have anything to say about cultural rights uh, of minorities. Of course, there are many decisions affecting persons who belong to a minority, uh, which are not specific to their status as a minority. Anything from, anything from you know, uh, right association, police violence, and so on. Um, my members of minorities can be affected by that. But culture-specific uh, culture decisions are very rare. So uh, I hope we will get to, to, the, to the reasons why, why that is so. Uh, so Neil talked about the uh, minority rights specific instruments we have at the Council of Europe. So the Framework Convention, the European Charter of Regional uh, and Mi Minority Languages are the two major instruments. And the major methods of advocacy using these instruments are shadow reports. Uh, we, all, we can also rely on these instruments before domestic courts and also before the European Court of Human Rights. So there are decisions when the European Court is referring to the Framework Convention on the, or the uh, Charter. It's very rare, but it happens. So there is a decision of Gorzelik and Poland. Uh, the advisory committee developed its understanding of whether the Silesian minority in Poland exists. They said it does. And when this case came before the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the court referred to the advisory committee committee's uh, opinion. So that's one way of, of uh, using uh, uh, the results of the shadow report, linking one advocacy tool to another. But when we look at, uh, and these shadow reports and advocacy before the Council of Europe, but these, I think, have become the major, the most important instruments for many minority communities, how to get their views across uh, to the international level. The obvious advantage of these instruments is that they are specific to minority rights. So the Framework Convention covers most issues relevant for most minority communities. Um, but, but they have important weaknesses. So they have a very weak enforcement mechanism. We heard about that. Also, they are very intransparent. So uh, there is no open consultation proceeding. There is, there is no trial, if you like. For the European Court, uh, you have equality of arms between the, the victim and the government. Uh, you have the same rights to present your views. Not so much before the Council of Europe, but 
whatever you put into the shadow report, you don't know what happens to it, who reads it, uh, what they do with it. And very often we find, and many others find that, uh, for, for unclear reasons, important information from the shadow report doesn't get to the opinion. We don't know why. So there is very little control uh, by minority communities over, over what happens with the shadow report. Uh, and there is very little opportunity to, to be engaged in those discussions later. And the standards are also very weak. Uh, the Council of Europe bodies uh, are not really using a human rights approach. I will give you a clear example later of how it's, dif how it's different from the approach of the European Court. They very much take into account states' interest and states' interest, uh, and they try to make compromises between the government's interest and community's interest, which is a different approach from the European Court. So let's look at the courts now. We have the Court of Justice of the EU, which is based in Luxembourg. Uh, you cannot apply that directly. They receive preliminary references from domestic court. And their major instrument in, in, uh, on minors' rights uh, is the Racial Equality Directive, which is about non-discrimination. And it's mostly about access to goods and services. So obviously, this is a very strong court. It has a very strong enforcement mechanism. But in terms of minority rights, it has a ner very narrow scope of protection. Uh, for most minority communities, uh, the directive is of little relevance. Uh, it's important in cases of direct discrimination or other or forms of indirect discrimination, but many cultural issues are just not protected by the directive. So this, this mechanism at the moment has very little relevance uh, for minority communities. <coughs> European Court of Human Rights, based in Strasbourg, it receives individual applications which is decides under the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, there was a proposal for a minority-specific protocol, which would cover uh, minority rights specifically. And also, there were proposals that the European Court would enforce directly the Framework Convention, but these were not, not adopted, not ratified by the states. So we currently don't have that. Uh, the advantages of the court is, again, it, ha it has a very strong enforcement mechanism. Has a high prestige, so governments usually listen to it. They listen to it better than they would to the Council of Europe or the Council of Europe bodies. It has a doctrine of effective protection of rights, so it's, it doesn't have just a formal approach of <coughs> what does a certain right cover, but uh, it looks at how effective the protection is in practice, and it uses a human rights approach, which means it doesn't simply try to balance uh, the state's interests and the and the victim's interests. Uh, for any limitations of rights, it needs, it requires a strong justification. So with, for example, the Framework Convention, the state doesn't really have to come up with a strong justification. Uh, simply, uh, it's accepted that promoting the state culture over minority cultures is a legitimate state interest. Uh, the advisory committee has said that many times. Not so much before the European Court. Uh, depending on a specific right, uh, there are specific reasons which the state has to pursue for limiting uh, a right. So the state, uh, the state's interest must fall under those reasons, and after that, it must be necessary for the state to 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 limit that right, uh, and the restriction must be proportionate. Uh, that's why, in many ways, the European Court is very effective. Uh, but again, the downsides: it's not specific to minority rights. And from the perspective of cultural rights, it has a narrow, narrow scope of protection. That's why there are so few cases uh, concerning cultural rights before it. There are a few, uh, so there aren't that many Roma rights cases as we would like, but nevertheless there have been some important decisions in this area. And the reason is most likely that Roma, is really, Roma are really the most socially excluded community, minority community in Europe, so they face uh, discrimination in many, uh, severe discrimination in many areas, police violence, exclusion from education, and so on. So there have been uh, an, some important decisions. Uh, for example, police violence has been recognized uh, in some other cases. Tomasi against France is an, import, is a, is an important well-known example uh, where the state of France uh, um, targeted members of the Corsican minority in, in the course of anti-terrorist uh, operations. Uh, identity rights uh, are barely covered. So the court has very low standard for them. The cases which we have 
uh, relate to uh, relate to situations where the existence of the minority was denied by the state. So, for example, Bulgaria and Greece denied the existence of the Macedonian minority. So, members of that minority tried to establish associations, and they were prohibited by the state. That's where the European Court said that this this is something you cannot do. So, prohibit community to establish an association uh, is not allowed. But the state doesn't have to do anything more. It doesn't have to doesn't have to support the minority. It doesn't have to uh, doesn't have to provide them financial support, for example, to pursue their activities. Uh, there were some of, of those kind of cases before the court, and they were not successful. One specific issue uh, which was successful before the court relates to education. So in Cyprus against Turkey, that's maybe maybe the only clear example of a cultural right. Uh, which was successful. So in northern Cyprus, uh, under Turkish uh, jurisdiction, uh, all secondary school, Greek secondary schools were abolished. And children who were studying there in Greek primary school simply didn't have secondary schools where to go to. They were advised to, to leave northern Cyprus or to go to Turkish schools. They didn't speak Turkish, so obviously going to Turkish schools was not, a, not an option, and there were no other secondary schools. So this is where the European Court said that uh, this uh, is not allowed under the Convention on the right, of the right to Education. But again, this is a very low, very low standard. The court didn't say that you, you must, uh, in countries you must establish uh, secondary schools for uh, teaching in minority languages, or that there must be a sufficient number of them, that they must be available for all members of the minority communities. None of that, uh, none of that has been said by the court. This, it's not uh, this blindness to cultural aspects of, of the rights covered by the European Convention is probably the main reason why we have so few cases. So I will talk about some some current uh, current pending cases, or specifically I will mention one or two current pending cases before the European Court, which are trying to develop uh, this agenda, which are trying to influence the court's understanding of how. Uh, cultural rights should be understood under under the existing existing uh, European Convention, and I think the the key articles for that, mostly Article 10, freedom of speech, uh, Article 8, private life, 9, freedom of religion, freedom of association, and, and non-discrimination, which Adam already mentioned. Uh, so freedom of speech uh, obviously covers, and we have many cases, uh, the state restricting. Uh, media restricting uh, publications and so on. What has not been considered by the court is, is the lang lang linguistic aspect of this, of this right. What if the state is restricting only uh, speech in a certain language? Uh, so one current case before, before the European court, one pending case, concentrates on a regional TV which was fined for using a minority language. In that specific country, I don't want to name the country because it's a pending case, uh, there is, a, there is a law on the state language which requires regional TVs to, to translate or, or uh, to trans, translate order broadcasting or to subtitle it into the state language. There is no similar requirement for minority languages. So you have areas populated by minorities, uh, they have their own regional TVs, and they broadcast in the state language or they translate everything to the straight state language. And if they fail to do so, they are fined by the National Broadcasting Authority. Uh, this issue has been brought before the uh, Advisory Committee and the Framework Commission, and they always gave a very weak, wishy-washy answer that, yeah, the state has an interest, the minority community is affected by it, so yeah, maybe they should figure it out, and there should be more consultation about how to implement this provision. The European Court, I think, will use a very different logic. So from their perspective, uh, it's really the, the speech of the regional TV, which was limited here, it's clear. If it was limited, what is, the, what, is the, what is the reason? What is the justification? And the state will have a hard time explaining uh, why it restricts uh, the speech of a, of a private uh, media broadcaster uh, without any compensation whatsoever, why it even uses financial sanctions to, to uh, um, to, to enforce such a, such a limitation. Uh, so the case uh, will be shortly, I hope, communicated to the government, and we will see how, how this issue will be, will be addressed by the European Court of Human Rights.
and I hope it will be much more progressive than, than the advisory committee uh, was. Uh, I give some other few examples. What issues are now uh, litigated, and some of them are being planned to be litigated before the European Court of Human Rights, by organizations which have tried to advocate for these issues uh, before the Council of Europe this, and they were moderately successful, they were not very happy about the outcome, and now they are trying to see whether they can make the European Court of Human Rights understand what these issues are about. So I already mentioned fines, uh, also threats of, threat of, threat of fines, uh, sorry, the threat of fines uh, for bilingual signs. So, sorry, what? <laughs> fines and threats. What is threats? Threats of so fines. Sorry, that's a title. <laughs> it should be threat of fine. Yeah, threats or signs. so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this illustrates the threat of threat of fine. <laughs> so in most countries, so sorry, sorry. No. You have, you have countries with restrictions on bilingual signs. Yeah. So for example, yeah. this is Slovakia, touristic signs. There is a law which says they all must be in Slovak. This is what the state does. So a private association <laughs> puts up a Hungarian English sign, unofficial one, before the, before the official state sign. Uh, and the regional authority tells the municipality, which is the town of Komarno, to take down the Hungarian English sign, otherwise they would be fined by 33,000 30, 30, 30, euros. It's a huge sign, a huge fine. Excuse me, who posted it and who tells them to take it up? Who posted it exactly? So there is a local association. Local association. Local association. And they private ask the, local association? Private. private. They ask the municipality, is it okay if we put up this sign? And the municipality says, yeah, fine, okay. we are happy with it. So they put it up. And then the regional authority comes and addresses not the association, which, which put up the sign, but the local municipality. Look, this is your sign. You have to take down the English-Hungarian sign. Uh, otherwise, we will fine you. We will fine you, not the association. So the municipality takes it down. Uh, and you can see how this is procedural difficult. Because it was the municipality which was threatened with the fine, but they would not litigate. Obviously, they don't want to get into a conflict with, with, the, with the authorities, and they, they also cannot apply to the European Convention. The association was affected. It, it, was, it is their sign which was taken down, uh, but they were not really threatened by a fine. It was the municipality. So nevertheless, this is, this is an issue uh, which, which will now get before the European Court of Human Rights. And I'm really interested how they will get over this procedural hurdle. I think it's, there is a clear argument to be made that the association is affected uh, by this threat, even if they were not directly threatened by the threat. Nevertheless, they bear the consequences. They have a, the case to the, the association. Yeah. The association. Uh, similar, similar examples, which are now pending or will go before the European Court of Human Rights shortly. Advertisement, similarly, you have restrictions in many European countries about the language of advertisement. Anybody affected, I think, would have a good chance of uh, uh, before the European Court of Human Rights under Article 10. Uh, public signs, uh, there are requirements to, to have bilingual signs on, on some, uh, uh, for example, of municipalities or public administration buildings, uh, but they are often ignored. Uh, street signs, road signs, and similar ones. There is another example, uh, language rights in healthcare. Uh, so this is one example where, where a person was denied uh, emergency treatment because she didn't communicate properly in the, in the state language in that specific country. Uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is an example which could go before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, this case is being prepared currently. Uh, and there are some other areas. Uh, right to education, support to culture, hate speech and violence, uh, denial of citizenship, and names, names on ID documents, are areas where the European Court of Human Rights currently has very limited understanding of how these specifically relate to minority communities having different language and different, different culture than the majority, majority culture. Uh, 
but this limited understanding is also the result that there have been very few cases before it, which, which allowed it to develop its understanding. So now it's time, I think, for, for uh, minority communities to try this, try this avenue as well. It's quite complicated. You need, uh, you need expertise on how to take the case before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and we are lagging behind the Roma community in, in, in having, having uh, a European center with, with that kind of expertise. But I think that's, that's, that's something which has not been tried until now uh, and could be a very, very effective and powerful tool uh, in advocating for minority rights, especially if used in concert with other, other instruments which have been, which have been uh, mentioned before. Thank you very much. That was my very short presentation. We have about 10 to 12 minutes um, for questions and discussion. That's each time. Yeah, um, with the, this, this last slide, I was thinking if you could name the articles from the convention that you were thinking of. I mean, which, article, which specific articles could be named uh, in these cases? Well, education is clear. Uh, but I guess hate speech and violence would be the right to dignity. Huh? No, Article 3, uh, freedom from ill treatment. Uh -huh. But also, yeah. freedom from ill treatment, yeah. but also Article 8, right to private life. Mm -hmm. And the other citizenship names and ID documents? Citizenship is complicated, uh, but uh, on the specific case, I'm thinking about Article 6. So it's the procedure for depriving people of citizenship, which is very often problematic and un unregulated. So there is one pending case relating to citizenship, and it's under Article Eight. Uh, sorry, Article Six. Eight is also a possibility, depending on the effects effects of uh, citizenship, and which one culture it's Article Eight, right to private life. But again, it's important. To be aware of the specific, specific issues in that in that case, so this is, citizenship can affect so many other areas. Right to vote, for example, if it's closely connected with right to vote. There is a specific article on right to vote, so a case could be taken under that. So it's Article Three of Protocol One. So it depends on uh, how you put it in context. What 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 the specific issue is before the domestic bodies? What are the specific consequences of lo loss of citizenship, which are Contested by the by the applicant. Yes. Um, thank you for the presentations. Um, my question is mostly about the EU advocacy tools in the EU. Um, I know that apart from the minority set type initiative uh, this year at the European Parliament in um, in February, I guess. Uh, the uh, European Parliament adopted a resolution initiated by the petition committee about the um, that after they received many uh, complaints about the issues of national minorities and this resolution was about the minority rights to improve their rights uh, in the EU. I was wondering if this resolution uh, would have any impact of the minority rights in the near future? Should I reply? Yeah, no. Well, I think, yeah. can you hear me? Well, um, well, resolutions don't necessarily have a, a direct impact and it's difficult to, to monitor their outcome. To my knowledge, there hasn't been any specific development in this sense. But, of course, every resolution is, is useful because it puts more pressure and underlines more certain topics. I don't know if you know something more about this. I don't know if it works. Uh. <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah, just fine. Yeah, I, 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 happen to, I happen to follow closely the fate of that resolution because uh, uh, my sister happens to be the secretary of the Petitions Committee and mm. we talked about mm. it. And <laughs> and to know. I'm, I'm quite skeptical. I'm quite skeptical about about the the large gulf between 
the claims of of politicians of how much that petition, how much that recommendation can achieve, and what's actually in 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 the recommendation itself. Uh, there is an underlying problem that the EU doesn't really have doesn't really have competence in minority rights. And while these recommendations and other soft instruments are are useful political to 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 reflect to to put emphasis on these issues politically, they cannot overcome the fact that the EU doesn't have, legally speaking, competence over these issues. And 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 the competence will not be created through these recommendations. Same same problem with the minority safe pack. Hmm. It tries to overcome the problem that the EU doesn't have competence. Uh, anything the EU will do as a legal step implementing the safe pack can only be something which is already in its competence. Mm -hmm. We already know that there is almost nothing which is, which is, the, which is in the EU's competence, and this cannot be solved by the safe pack. It can be solved only by, by changing, uh, renegotiating the, the, the basic the, the treaties, and nobody's opening that. And we know that that effort would probably fail at the moment. So all these advocacy uh, before the EU bodies uh, has these shortcomings when they concentrate on the, on the legal effects of, of what they want to achieve. Nevertheless, the EU remains a very powerful actor when it's actually implementing uh, minority rights which already exist. So for example, I agree with what Neil said, they are very effective in, in actually implementing uh, recommendations of the Council of Europe bodies because they, those have a solid legal basis. But what their own legal basis? Not, that Not so much. much. Yeah. I have a question for Adam. That you mentioned those two cases which were related to the right to education, mm -hmm. and you showed us how different was the decision of the Grand Chamber compared to the first mm -hmm. Why is that? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I don't know from the inside, so I can only say from the outside. I have spoken to people who worked at the court at the time, actually, and I mean, they have a different story to tell. But I mean, just reading the judgments, I think the governments that were defending those cases were doing a really good job of trying to present their efforts as being anti-discriminatory. So they were, present they were telling a story about Romani children not being in the education system at all, and look at the wonderful things that we've done to bring Romani children into school. Um, and not only in those cases, but also the Greek cases, which I didn't get into. Those didn't have the same flip. Those were decided on uh, by the chamber. But the story is always very much one of, um, I would say, a kind of racist Roma blaming, which is kind of, you know, that the, as if to say the base point is Romani children don't go to school. And we, as a state, as a public administration, have had to do all of these things in order to get Romani kids into school. And I think that they were able to convince the court, in those two cases, at the chamber level, that that's what was going on, and so that they should be applauded, basically. Um, and I think the grand chamber saw past it. Um, and the, the, those chamber judgments make interesting reading, as well as the dissenting opinions in the grand chamber. Um, particularly in DH, I can't remember which judge it is now, but there was one dissenting judge who sort of said, you know, this is the path to the end of everything if we allow these kinds of cases. Um, one thing that's interesting about those cases that I think is worth saying, I mentioned something before about, so that you, in order to bring an application to the European Court of Human Rights, you must be a victim. So there's a kind of individualization around the cases, which I think can be very frustrating when you're trying to bring forward systemic violations because they ultimately look very much at your individual case. And I think that that happened in the, um, at least one of the sterilization cases that I mentioned. It's sort of, you want to raise a pattern of forced sterilization of Romani women, and the court keeps saying, well, we don't see anything in this woman's case that was about her being Roma. They just, you know, what... Um, and the one thing that happened in DH, which was really unusual, there's one line in there where they say, having shown a pattern of discrimination and that the children were subjected to it, we don't need to get into their individual. And that's a line that we quote a lot in cases that we bring to the court, which is saying, look, once you've shown the pattern, we don't need to get into the individual stories. And I do think that that's where the court gets very uncomfortable. Um, and I think that's why the DH judgment was very controversial within the court. This kind of stepping above the individual case to look at the broad pattern, which can be very, very hard to do. Um, and maybe that's also where there's a bit of this tension between the chamber level and the grand chamber level in those judgments. 
going to bridge the gap between the courts looking at individual. If you have a whole bunch of people who have been affected by all, all of them split at the same time, does that mean that it has been? I can say something about that. So class action, as a, uh, it, the, the kind of American style class action mechanism doesn't exist in most European countries, okay. uh, but there are equivalents. So in some jurisdictions, particularly Hungary and Slovakia and Serbia, you can bring, or Bulgaria, you can bring what's commonly called axio popularis litigation, where actually, usually under the anti-discrimination legislation, so an NGO that was set up to protect the interests of a certain minority group can bring a case in its own name. And there, and in that way, you don't have a, a class like you would, let's say, in the US, um, where you say, oh, our class consists of 10,000 people or 100 people. But you have, in several of our cases, are the European Roma Rights Center versus Ministry of Education or Ministry of Human Capacities in Hungary. Um, uh, and that's one way of litigating. It has its strengths and weaknesses. The strength is exactly what I was just talking about. You can actually just point to the whole pattern. So I can give one example here in Hungary. We know well, this happens all over Europe, but we've, we've done the case here in Hungary and another one in, in Serbia, where we know that Romani families are targeted for having their children taken into care. If we were to bring that as one family's case to the court and try to make the, uh, that one case into the whole pattern, the whole case would be about that one family, the one unhappy family, if to be literary about it, right? Um, whereas with the case where it's the European Roma Rights Center versus Ministry of Human Capacities in Hungary or a case in, in Serbia, uh, it's ERRC versus the city of Belgrade, we're able to say, here is the data. We're not talking about individual families, just you've got a problem, right? 20% of the children in this county are Romani, 85% of the children in care are Romani, you've got to mismatch what's going on. Um, so there's a real strength there. The weakness is that you cannot, probably you cannot then take that case to the European Court of Human Rights. Because the European Court of Human you can't as an NGO then, you know, let's say that we lose that case. We can't go as European Roma Rights Center to the European Court of Human Rights because we weren't the victim of the violation. There's a bit of a question mark hanging over procedurally now as to whether an affected family could now go to the European Court of Human Rights saying, those people exhausted domestic remedies for me. Um, and if you are interested in this, there was a case called KOSA, K-O-S-A, versus Hungary that dealt with that issue at the end of last year. Um, where they were not allowed to bring the individual case. It was about school segregation. But the court left kind of the door open, saying in certain circumstances, maybe you could. We have time for one more question. There were two here. Two, okay, two short questions. Thank you, really. Thank you to the speakers. I, my question to them also. Uh, you say when, when, uh, this time, when we are sent from the... Uh, cases on the court about my, uh, Roma minorities. Is it because Roma don't trust in this court or because the court don't take care of this issue? And what do you do to increase this percentage? Sure. So the, I could, the, the, the easier answer is the second part. I can say the thing that we're doing to increase the numbers by we're bringing more cases. So the ERC in 2017 brought 11 new cases where we were representing Romani people to the European Court of Human Rights, which was the biggest year ever. And so far, we've also brought 11 just at this point this year. So hopefully, we'll bring a few more this year and we'll, we'll surpass last year's number. So there is, I mean, it's not all about numbers, but numbers are important. Why are there so few judgments about Roma rights? I don't want to say that it's because Roma don't trust the European Court of Human Rights. I mean, I think that that would be too pat an answer. I think it's that uh, the barriers to access to justice are... are, are such that Romani people don't have the opportunity to get their cases to the domestic courts in the first place, and maybe don't have access to the legal aid systems and to the lawyers who could take the cases. So it is really difficult, I think, particularly in some circumstances, for Romani people to get access to a lawyer to enable them to bring the case to court in the first place because of structural discrimination in the legal aid system, because of other barriers. It may in some cases also be that people just feel defeated. And so they don't want to challenge. But I don't, I've, I've not met Romani people who say, oh, I don't want to go to court because I don't believe in it. I've never met anyone who would say anything like that. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting what you said about um, the DH case and, and uh, the fact that the individual was, that they took the line that they demonstrated the pattern. I mean, with the exception of DH, if, if the, generally the court is reluctant to do that, then that basically is saying the court can't address discrimination. You can't just in individual keep taking individual cases. Okay, in one case this person was discriminated against. In another case, just one person. You have to have a pattern mm. to address discrimination. You have to address the pattern. 
So does 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 that raise a question that the court just can't, just is not set up properly to do that? Or could we maybe see DH as part of, of a progression towards properly addressing it? I can add, but my, my answer to this would be, I think you're right that there's a problem here. Um, but I do think there's a way around it, and I think the way around it, so I don't think DH is the start of some great jurisprudence of, of patterns and practices. I think that DH was a kind of high water mark, and I don't want to do much more of that. But I think part of the problem has been that, you know, you're supposed to exhaust domestic remedies before you go to Strasbourg, and most of the cases that get brought are not articulated as discrimination cases before the domestic courts. And I think the way to, and certainly that was the case from the ERC, and I think what we've seen very little of is people going to civil courts in Europe, or administrative courts, depending upon the way that it's set up, but people going and saying, my right to be free from discrimination was breached, and formulating the case from the beginning as a discrimination case. Mm -hmm. So the forced sterilization cases, for example, tend to be brought under medical tort laws, or the equivalent. Mm -hmm. The police brutality cases were brought under... Uh, people who make complaints to the prosecutor or the equivalent of the Independent Police Complaints Commission in their countries. They were not civil discrimination cases, and we're trying to bring more of those down. I think once those cases are there before the court, um, the court will have a hard time not dealing with them as discrimination cases if that's how they were decided. Uh, one really interesting case that comes to mind, or a couple, that it was a case about discrimination in citizenship in Denmark, uh, race discrimination, because you, the difference between people who were of Danish descent and not of Danish descent, and it was argued as that in the courts, and the courts talked about all of this, using this really, I thought, hideous language of people being of Danish extraction, not of Danish extraction, all of that discourse was there, and so when it arrived in, in the lap of the judges in Strasbourg, they had no choice but to engage with it, so we have to do more of that. We have to bring the case and say, from the start, that it was race discrimination. Mm -hmm.